Okay, so let's talk quickly about what makes up a good shelter kit and it, it's standard kind of across the board it, This is common to any type of shelter kit that you have Regardless of the environment you're in you need something to sleep under you need something to sleep on and You need something to sleep in and you need some cordage. That's kind of a standard shelter kit So what I've got here is I've got an oil cloth tarp with a thermo rest. I've got just a, a wool blanket uh, some Number 36 bank line, and in this case, I've actually got some stakes, just because I like to carry stakes for this particular shelter configuration that I'm gonna set up for you guys. Today. Okay, so when I'm trying to look for a place to establish a shelter, what the things that I'm looking for are the five W's, and there's two that I wanna be close to, three that I wanna be away from. The first two are I wanna be near a water source and I wanna be near a lot of wood. I need that wood to build, and I need that wood for my fire. Uh, I wanna be away from the actual, uh, I wanna be out of the wind, um, I want to be away from widow makers, which are basically dead trees that could fall on me and cause injury. And uh, I want to be away from wigglies, you know, the, the biting ants, biting insects, snakes, etc. So when I'm looking to establish a shelter, those are the five things that I'm considering. I've chosen this location because we're in kind of a thicket of, of white pine. I've got lots of dead, dry firewood on the ground and up in the trees. I've got a natural windbreak and it gives me some great overhead cover. So it shades me from the sun and it also gives me some additional protection during a rainstorm. So the couple other considerations for, for why I chose this actual location, besides just the five W's, I mean, obviously I wanted to be in some cover to get a windbreak and have some more better overhead cover, some shade when it's hot. Uh, but the other thing that, that I like most about this area is I, I want to signal for rescue and I want to be ready to do that on a moment's notice. So. I've got this to where it's facing the south so that I have southern exposure. I can, you know, kind of take advantage of that warmth if it's cold, but also so that I can face a nice little clearing out here to where if I do see something, I can rush out to my signal unimpeded and I can get those lit as quickly as possible and get those signals uh, live, you know, to, to kind of affect my rescue, my chances of being rescued that much better. Uh, so aside from just the, the wind and there's a lot of wood supply, uh, Aside from the five W's, that's why I chose this particular location. Uh, so I've got a good view of the actual field where I'm going to set my signals out. Okay, so to tie the bowl in, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull out a length, about an arm's length, and I'm trying to create a loop. So when I'm creating this loop, basically where the, the line crosses back over itself, what I want to do is I have the, the running end which is the shorter end, on the bottom of the standing end, which is the longer end. So that's how it should start. Then from the standing end, I'm going to push a bite up through. And what I've done is created this window. Once I have that window, the standing end, the shorter end, is going to go, come from the direction of my chest out through that loop. Can't do it the other way leave myself about a three to four inch tail. In this case, I'm creating a bite where it doesn't cross back over itself. Now I can let go of everything, pull on the standing end, the longer end, and I've created my bowling. And I know it's correct because I have, my standing end is coming out of a teardrop shape. I've got a cross locking bar, and my running end is on the inside of the loop. That's a correct bowling. With this running in, I'm going to create basically a loop around this side of the other loop. So I've created a loop and I'll pass right back through. That creates an overhand knot, which is basically a security knot that's going to keep my bowline from coming undressed or untied completely. So it's a security knot. So that is a completed bowline with an overhand security. Take that bowline, I'll go around the tree. I've made my loop large enough to where I can pass this entire back fed portion through and it keeps it from getting tangled. Then I'll tighten that. Then I can run this directly across, letting it back feed out of my hand. To the other side where I'll come around and then I can just drop it. From here, I'm going to establish an overhand slip because I'm building a trucker's hitch. So for the overhand slip, I'll make a loop in the middle of the line. 
then I'll take that loop and pull a bite through it, just like we started the bowl. What's important at this point is that I have the knot going towards my first anchor and I have a slip going towards the anchor I'm going to pull tension towards. It won't work the other way around. So now I've created that, my slip is on the correct side. That is an overhand slip. Then I can come through that overhand slip with my line and pull tension, giving me a mechanical advantage. Once I've got it tight enough, I can pinch it right here. I can establish a half hitch on a bite. Unlock that in place. What this does is it gives me a quick release so that when I'm ready to go, I can just pull this out and everything will come apart. So the next knot that I'm going to tie is I'm going to establish a little toggle system on here because a toggle will take some of the stress off of my tarp and it also allows me to tighten it up or adjust it uh, without taking down my ridge line. So the first thing I need to do is take about a uh, 12 to, to 16 inch piece of cordage and I'm going to make a loop. When I'm making this loop, I'm going to tie what's called a fisherman's knot. And all a fisherman's knot is two, is, is two opposing overhands tied on each other's or on each end. So I'm going to tie an overhand around one side, and an overhand is nothing more than making a loop around that part of the line, and then I'm going to come back up through. Very simple stop knot. Then, on the opposite side, I'm going to do the same thing. Now I've created a double overhand that's opposing, which is also called a fisherman's knot. Sometimes it's also called a, a necklace knot because a lot of people will make their neck, langer, neck lanyards out of that and they can adjust it as needed. But anyway, that is a loop made from a fisherman's knot. Now I'll take that and I'm going to tie a Prusik to my ridge line. Prusiks are designed for cordage or line of a smaller diameter to be tied to cordage or line of a larger diameter. Uh, so a typical four to six wrap Prusik would be, uh, would be sufficient for that. But because I'm using the same size, same diameter cordage to tie my Prusik, I'm gonna have to do probably about eight wraps. So to tie the Prusik, when I already have a loop, I'm gonna kind of offset my fisherman's knot and get it out of the way. I'm just gonna place it over, reach through, and pull it over. That first time, that's called a lark's head or a girth hitch, depending on how big the actual diameter of the thing you're tying it around is. And I'm gonna to continue to pass that through several times. Each time gives me two loops. So right now I'm at one, two, three on one side, one, two, three on the other, that's a six wrap. I'll come through one more time, and I've got an eight wrap brusic. Then I just gotta tighten everything up. And I'm good to go. So with the Prusik, you don't want to have any of your lines crossing over each other. And this should be coming out of the center and you should have a cross locking bar. And that locking bar allows you to slide it and tighten it down. Now I've got this established. I've got a toggle on standby. I can set up the point for my plow point. 